Okay, let's resume. This is the last formal session of our uh, uh, shrunken but not truncated, uh, if that makes sense, um, Early Modern Global Caribbean Conference. I'm Carlo Pistana, one of the co-conveners along with Molly Warsh. Um, this last uh, session is called Logics of Profit, and I will um, just explain that at the end of this session, we will have the usual probably half an hour or so Q&A around those specific papers, and then we will open up for a larger conversation in which we connect all the papers across um, the various panels and talk about the bigger issues as a way to kind of wrap up at the end. So uh, welcome to this final formal session. Um, I'll introduce, as we have been doing, each speaker when they speak. The first uh, speaker to this afternoon, in Los Angeles at least, is uh, Pablo Gomez, who's Associate Professor of History and the History of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His book has already been referenced uh, in this uh, conference, The Experiential Caribbean, Creating Knowledge and Healing in the Early Modern Atlantic. And the paper that he's giving today is Early Modern Caribbean Slavery and the Imagination of Universal Quantifiable Bodies and Diseases. So I hand it over to Pablo. Thank you, Carla. Uh, can, can you guys hear me? Excellent. Um, well, thank you for the introduction. And um, I want to start by thanking again, Carla and Molly for the invitation, for persevering, for uh, this fantastic work and Steve Hindle and everybody at the hunting for really organizing this uh, wonderful, uh, really wonderful uh, event. Even, you know, I, I feel so sorry that we cannot be together because I'm having so much fun with this conversation, even, you know, online. Uh, uh, but it is, it is what we have to do right now. I also want to thank all, all our panelists before. It was uh, it's been terrific papers. And, and I don't know if it is only me. It just seems that on Zoom, uh, it's either because on Zoom the time kind of is shortened or is the paper has been so good, like we have been running out of time every single time. So really, really good, good stuff. Um, so for those of you who had a chance to read it, um, you will see that the paper is more, more of a prolegomenon for a book project in which I'm working um, and more general of a reflection on what I feel can be ways in which this history of the early modern Caribbean um, can inform and offers uh, new ways of thinking about early histories of science and medicine. So I'm gonna share my screen with you today. Um, and this is really more a, a kind of a think piece historical paper. Uh, so the slides are more kind of a way of setting up the mood and making reference to some of the, uh, some of the uh, works that I'm uh, referring to. All right, can you see the, the slides? Yes, okay, good. So the paper I start by briefly talking about how the historiography of slavery has engaged with the archive involving transactions of African slaves. As I describe in the paper, the afterlife of these forms of valuation organized not only the propertization of land and life, but also, as we know, the racialized value of human beings with the privileging of whiteness. So the logic of the processes of quantification and organization of the slave trade contained in the colonial archives of European empires has discussed also in a substantial literature, some of which has been referenced by some of uh, the presenters today, as point of departure for the examination of the role of the slave trade in the conformation of Atlantic economies, societies, and culture. The nature of the extent sources we have to examine early modern history of slavery is obviously at the core of the difficulties that historians have had in their attempts at rediscovering or recovering non-European voices, histories from them. So a number of scholars have pointed out the sources were created on the basis of violent processes for colonial categorization. And then the voices, desires, and ideas of people of African descent appear as matriculized, if they do. They are channeled through categories of imperial organization that bound peoples and cultures. Enslaved Africans were not obviously just numbers. Africans and their descendants could have reached life wars in the Atlantic. A concurrent exploration of such, such life wars as they existed within the contours of slave trading communities is crucial for the understanding of the ideation of knowledge making about the natural war in the 17th century. As I, 
and other historians have shown that the recovery of the life experiences and variety of words and spaces of refugia created by people of African descent in the Atlantic War is possible through the use of archives produced by European colonial regimes. And obviously I'm referring, referencing here in general to the work of so many, many of the people that are right here at this conference uh, in, in, and that have spoken before me. So in the paper, I refer to notions of reality and what is real, not as a way of privileging, privileging, I'm sorry, Europe, American ontological positions about the nature of the world. Rather, I use them as a point of departure for thinking about the epistemic categories and hierarchies that scholars use to examine data and archives related to the materiality of human bodies and the natural world, and specifically about the idea that quantifications of different sorts provide nature uh, the best evidence that we have to analyze the historical impact of disease, natural disasters, the rhythm of seas and the earth, geographical location, or the fall forces of economics. An idea that, as simplified in, in an overview of Atlantic cultural history, make explicit the contrast between what some historians consider to be the quote unquote harness of natural, geographically defined in this planet's survey uh, in, the, in the early 16th century, and economic structures compared to what some will call the softness of art, music, philosophy, and religion. When labeled as cultural or political tropes and their prevailing metaphysics of a universal nature, non-European, I'm sorry, not Euro american definitions of how the world operated appear only as soft reactions to the harness of real material explanations. It's just kind of a background of, of, of uh, how, where this project is situated. This essay, reflects on the ways in which the history of the slave trade is linked to the emergence of partic particular hierarchies of scientific and biomedical knowledge making, such as those related to the calculations of bodies in nature that gave rise to the analytical categories that I just enunciated. So to it, the paper argues that in addition to the incorporation of African diasporic ways of knowing the natural world into narratives about histories of knowledge production in the Atlantic, it is also essential to recognize how the epistemic practices undergird and the development of this late trade as a technological, bureaucratic, economic, legal, and intellectual practice went hand in hand with the appearance of modern notions fundamental for our understanding of biomedicine, demography, epidemiology, and concepts of risk. Some of those tropes are still in circulation and we have been using them uh, very much over the past months because of our current situation and the pandemic. So the rest of the paper focuses on these epistemic practices, the grammar, if you will, of the archives of the slave trade, and how they are intrinsically related to the emergence of the historicist practices that characterize histories of medicine, science, and the environment, and their engagement with non-European ways of knowing the world. So in the project, I'm generally interested in exploring the possibilities for, the, for writing histories of science and medicine that engage with that archive, the archive of the slave trade, and the violent constitutive nature of its logic as a way of escaping paternalistic attempts at inclusivity that have characterized in many ways uh, these more inclusive global terms in the history of his, in science and medicine specifically during the past decades. I also reflect in the paper the moral consequences of uniquely the crime is late trading records as abhorrent and not related to the scientific and biomedical foundational epistemologies of our times. This is different uh, to what I'm going to be talking in a second, because historians have engaged in, 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 in with the with the uh, with the slave trade in records and, and the record of the transatlantic slave trade and, and, and science, but in different ways, not as fundamental to the ways in which we think about uh, our bodies and, and risk today. So the idea that humans uh, uh, that we could use numbers, statistic, risk measurements, and mathem mathematical calculations to make predictions about phenomena of all sorts is one of the fundamental markers of the transformations at the core of the ways of producing knowledge of the early modern era. This has been examined by multiple historians in relationship also to the emergence of ideas about universal bodies and medical quantification. We're talking about a period that most people uh, trace throughout the 17th century, especially late 17th century and into the 18th century. And uh, more largely, statistics uh, and epidemiology 19th, 18th, 19th century and 20th century. So these histories of numbers, labors, and bodies and are more famously studied in the histories of, for instance, political arithmetics and economy, epitomized by the work of people like William Petty. The history of the so-called great divide of the 17th century and 18th century 
is thus central for the emergence of not only modern scientific notions, epistemologies, but also our own ways of doing history and approaching archives and the creation of hierarchies of data. So the idea of the great divide, and here you have a page of one of the fundamental texts of, of uh, this process and imagination of, of how it went, the Encyclopedia of Diderot and D'Alembert, refers to the history of how from the 17th century on, natural historians, anthropologists, and scientists, among others, have located cultural and religious practices and objects of different sorts within institutional and epistemological spaces that differentiate them from those of scientific and later biomedical knowledge. So that the divergence created nature in a material realm separated from ideas about person. And this is the very conceptual space where slave bodies could be thought of as chattel. Uh, the fact that we still have these divisions so integrated within our own uh, methodologies might seem inevitable because our own ways of doing history emerge precisely out of these practices. Practices that are also related to the processes and the interconnected work slavery, European expansion, exploitation, and industrialization of the early modern era. So this is also intrinsic to our own fields. So, but in the terms of science and medicine, the histories of science and medicine, this notion is particularly intrinsic to the ways in which uh, the field themselves concept, conceive of themselves. So the very idea of the imperial nature of the universalizing impulses of science have certainly been a departing point for the literature on global history of science and medicine for a while now. And what is more, this is what I was referring before, historians of science and medicine have examined the connection between the history of slavery and colonialism and the history of science and medicine itself. So I'm here and just providing you with some recent examples. They have done so, however, almost exclusively to discuss the emergence of concepts about biological race or medical experimentation. This is as a critique of the most abhorrent episodes in the history of Euro-American modern ways of scientific knowledge making. So we have plenty of insightful works linking scientific practices, anthropology, ethnology, and political economy, among others, to eugenic racism and colonialism of different sorts. These studies, by and large, however, do not dwell to how the basic strategies and analytic, and analytic categories that historians of science depend are on are related, I'm sorry, to the strategies that early modern Europeans used to enslave, kidnap, and trade millions of Africans. So in the paper I propose that if we are willing to accept that, as Walter Johnson argues, borrowing from Cedric Robinson, the part, that departing from ideas about the ways in which slave societies and slave traders dehumanize enslaved Africans is just a convenient way of separating our own liberal progressive selves from the violent histories of the early modern world. And I think he's right. We should also pay similar attention to the paradoxical ways in which historians of science and medicine have delimited their areas of study and archives that they use. We know that the economic and social edifice of many of the European and American institutions from where science and biomedicine emerge, or at least those that form the backbones of intellectual histories about them, for instance, the Royal Society, the British Museum, the French Academy, and universities on both sides of the Atlantic was built on the basis of colonialism and in many cases directly on the profits of the slave trade. But there are even more fundamental connections between these two histories. Because the grammar of science is so deep, deeply implicated in the ways we think about our world and reality, they have profound political implications. And this is true even at a time when science and the nature of truth and evidence have come under attack. So the answer for me is not a disavowal of the value of evidence or of rigorous archival and empirical research that those emerging from the archives of the slave trade. Instead, thinking about not only how historians have used the archives of the slave trade, but the epistemic apparatus we use to process provide clarity about those moral consequences. So for instance, in one of my current research projects, that, that, that book project that I'm talking about, I explored how early modern Atlantic slave trading communities and the African diasporic communities emerging uh, from the world of slavery in the early modern Caribbean intensely fashioned concurrent forms of being in the world that conceive of universal, global, if you will, notions of human corporality in the 17th century. African slaves and their bodies, as detailing their types of the transatlantic slave trade, emerge and the approach I use here as essential, if paradoxical links, and points of, points of inflection between the histories of divergence that have formed in profound ways, Western understanding of the modern world, the natural world, and human nature. I'll be happy to talk a little bit more about the project in the Q&A. And I know I'm running out of time, so let me just conclude. 
The records of the transatlantic slave trade coming from the early modern Caribbean, I think, should serve as more than a repository for the extraction of data about the numerical characteristics of epidemiology, diseases, demography, or the circulation of knowledge about the natural world, the emergence of the Republic of Letters, or the association between the history of science, the history of colonialism, and the obscuring of uh, Amerindian and African knowledges. The logics and categories of the world of racial capitalism, one that depended on the traffic of human beings registered in the slave trading accounts, was also essential for the development of early modern ways to, of, of thinking about risk, numbers, human bodies, and the natural world in general. The answer to the challenges of contemporary planetary, environmental, and social crisis can and should be informed by a recognition of how the value we place on scientific knowledge in our society obscure the violent ways around which it was built and their ongoing consequences. So for instance, the stubborn persistence of race as a quantifiable biomedical category, now camouflage under the guise of genomics among other uh, disciplines. These violent histories should help us recognize not alien words, but instead the possibilities that created ours. The relationship between the grammar and logic of slavery and science should promote discussions about notions of, of what constitutes justice, human rights, and how they are related to the ways in which we think and, and measure ourselves, health disparities, and environmental catastrophes of all sorts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is Pernilla Royer, assistant professor at, at the University of Pittsburgh, who is um, speaking to us late at night, I believe, <laughs> because uh, she's in Europe right now. Um, she has a recent book, Economies and the Reinvention of Empire, France and the Americas in Africa, uh, 1750 to 1802. And her paper is entitled Foreigners and Foreign Capital in the Danish West Indies uh, from about 1750 to 1800. Pernilla? Yeah, can you hear me all? Yeah, okay. So thanks so much for that introduction and also thank you so much Carla and Molly for putting together this really terrific conference. I really enjoyed it. And also to uh, Steve and his team at the Huntington Library. I really appreciate all the effort that you've had to do um, against the backdrop of a global pandemic and all the things I can imagine is also going on in your lives that you haven't complained about. <laughs> but um, I fear that my presentation um, in it, I'm going to commit at least three full paths. Uh, the first is that um, I am going to speak about the 18th century and not only that, also about the second half of the 18th century. Um, the second uh, full path is that I'm going to focus predominantly on European actors. Although I acknowledge we know so much about Europeans in the Caribbean, about their networks, um, uh, and as well as their perspectives on the early modern global Caribbean. And the third is that I'm going to talk about uh, this through an imperial and trans-imperial and perhaps Atlantic lens more so than an actual global one. So um, apologies from the outset. <laughs> um, before I, I talk about the paper itself, um, I wanted to say a few words about the larger project that it's a part of. And I didn't mention that in my paper. As Carla mentioned, I finished a book about the French colonial empire in the 18th century, in the, really in the context of its uh, global rivalry with Britain. But as I was studying this, I became increasingly interested in understanding how smaller European empires navigated this global moment of European rivalry. So how is it possible, for instance, for a small power such as the Kingdom of Denmark, Norway, uh, which had colonies stretching from Greenland to the Caribbean to uh, trade stations in West Africa and colonies in India to survive and perhaps even thrive um, as these battling giants were at each other's throat. I knew from my work on the French case that part of the answer was a Danish espousal of uh, the policy of neutrality in times of war. And another one was the construction of a free port system in the Caribbean. Uh, but the more I paid attention to the Danish uh, colonies, the more I also realized that the answer had to come from the fact that the Danish colonial empire was not very Danish at all. Instead, 
It was crowded with people from other destinations who were able to use Danish colonies and policies to enhance their own interests while helping the Danish uh, keep the colonial empire afloat. So this project, which I uh, sort of provisionally entitled uh, A Gateway to Empire, uh, Danish Colonial Expansion in a Trans-Imperial World, is an effort to tell this story, uh, not just through the eyes uh, of the Danish and not just uh, by respecting the contours of the formal French, Dan uh, sorry, Danish colonial empire, but also uh, through uh, uh, um, the people uh, from various destinations who, uh, across Europe and the Caribbean, for instance, who lived, worked, moved through, invested in, or in some ways benefited from it. Um, I have to say I'm still uh, at the stage of archival research, but um, I've taken this uh, conference as an opportunity to draft some ideas uh, about uh, my focus on the Caribbean context. Um, I'm particularly interested in highlighting how categories of foreignness within certain imperial frameworks did not always function as features of exclusion, but also as vehicles uh, for licit gain. We've come to think of flows of foreign capital in and out of Caribbean colonies and across imperial boundaries as part of an illicit or informal economy which sustained Caribbean communities, particularly during times of warfare, hurricanes, uh, and rebellion, but as I want to show, um, many Europeans through a, a rigorous calculation of sorts were able to make considerable gain through legal avenues of profit within colonial powers of which they were not necessarily an inherent part. So in the paper itself, um, I open uh, with a quotation from a French produced uh, work known as the Histoire philosophique et politique des établissements et du commerce des Européens dans les deux Indes, so the history of the two Indies, um, which swept across Europe and the Atlantic in the 1770s. And it was sort of seen as a learned critique of European colonialism. And in it, um, the authors uh, have this interesting assessment about the Danish West Indies, in which they say that Denmark has to acknowledge that a substantial part of its uh, riches that is starting to arrive from its colonies in the Caribbean do not fall into Danish pockets, but predominantly into Dutch and English ones. And because of it, the authors uh, say, uh, the Danish government needs to uh, uh, undertake a rigorous cal calculation and ensure that uh, colonial profits fell only into Danish hands. So this was sort of like their enlightened advice to, uh, to the Danish. Now, what I try to show in this paper is that this way of thinking about the Danish West Indies rested on a complete misconception of how the Kingdom of Denmark Norway had uh, even managed to establish these colonies in the first place, let alone uh, ensure that they became producers of cash crop commodities uh, and sources of profit. Because for a small maritime power with a sparse population and limited resources, Building a global empire required foreign assistance in the form of people, labor, material, and capital. So um, in the first part of the paper, I, I pay attention to the way in which the Danish West India Company uh, tried to attract planters from the Caribbean and um, Europe by offering them cheap land and tax exemptions during the first uh, eight years of their stay in the colonies. So I look at it first uh, uh, as they try to settle St. Thomas in the late 17th century, and then as they try to settle uh, St. John in the early 18th century. Um, and we see that within a few decades, um, uh, uh, both islands are settled with only few Danes, but mostly Dutch, English, French, Irish, Flemish, German, Swedish, Scottish, Brazilian, and Portuguese settlers. Um, um, and then we see uh, in 1733, the, the Danish West India Company is able to purchase uh, St. Croix, which is a colony that is more conducive to um, plantation, um, complex in the production of cash crops. So they purchase this island from the French. And again, this, this policy repeats itself. Um, and I know uh, Elena mentioned already the work of Neville Hall, and he's also for this whole policy uh, of settlement uh, that the Danes are using, coined this, this concept of uh, colonization by invitation. So basically that's what's going on in sort of the early stages of, uh, of Danish colonization in, in the Caribbean. 
And we have very good visual evidence of this sort of multinational patchwork of foreign interests for St. Croix in the second half of the 18th century. Uh, we have it because of this map that was created by Jens Michael Beck uh, from 1754, which is at the moment where the Danish crown takes over from the West India Company. Um, and this map uh, here is then actually uh, 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 updated again in 1770. And um, if you look closely at it, you will see that uh, uh, aside from sort of the plantation lots, there are written names on top of all the plantations. So we have some idea of who the owners are. And if you zoom in on it, um, you can see all the names here. And as you can see, uh, many, few of them are actually Danish. Um, some of them are uh, um, uh, names such as Peter Heiliger, it's a Dutch name, and he actually um, came from the uh, Dutch colony of St. Eustatius to the island. It's uh, Irish names like Nicholas Tuit, uh, who had initially uh, plantations in Mont uh, Montserrat and then had moved back to London, uh, but then purchased land in uh, the Danish uh, uh, colonies. And then up here we see um, uh, Baron von Schimmelmann, who is a very wealthy uh, man from uh, initially from Dresden, um, who also purchases um, uh, colonies there. And these are sort of really prominent and successful planters, all of these three. Um, um, and they also have uh, great contract, uh, contacts to uh, the Danish court and, and across uh, different uh, colonies and uh, in Europe. Um, but I'm also really interested in sort of looking at less prominent uh, planters, and I haven't really put that into the paper I circulated, but I'm trying to um, uh, also get into these stories of, of uh, less well-off investors, so both men and women, uh, whites and people of color um, from the Caribbean, but also throughout uh, Europe. All right, so paying attention to uh, these planters and their uh, uh, investments lead, of course, also to networks of credit and debt. Um, so in the Danish Caribbean, we shouldn't just think of this as sort of like an El Dorado of, of foreign capital interests, if it wasn't. Uh, many of these planters that, whose names you see here um, became indebted, just like we see planters uh, did in other uh, European colonial empires or in the Caribbean. And so, um, if we follow sort of the, the depth also, we also realize that here too, it's not something that is just operating within a, an imperial framework. Uh, initially, lots of this debt is owed to the Danish West India Company, but as the crown takes over, it, it sort of starts pressuring uh, these planters to pay as, as quickly as possible. And in the process, many of these planters uh, seek uh, uh, money lenders from outside of uh, Denmark, and they very quickly um, sort of uh, tap into the Dutch capital market. So from the 1760s, um, we see big uh, money lenders and, 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 and uh, houses, uh, one in particular is mentioned time and time again, it's Abraham Teboch uh, and Son who are able to offer uh, loans to planters in exchange, of course, for their produce so that they can tap into um, the production of sugar in the Danish colonies. So um, as I show in the paper, increasingly um, the Danish crown uh, <laughs> realizes that about 50% of the sugar production sort of goes elsewhere. Um, and it, it, it's sort of aware of it, but it also uh, can't really uh, do much about it. But by 1786, um, the crown decides to purchase these Dutch loans as to try to redirect more of this sugar back to Copenhagen where, and other provinces in Denmark where it has also uh, invested and started establishing lots of uh, sugar refineries. Um, and what's interesting is that the, the, the documents for um, these uh, purchases, um, uh, they, again, if you look at the names, they, they're here, they're sort of reveal lots and lots of foreigners. So we can just see even at this later stage uh, towards the late and end of the 18th century, the Danish uh, government is lending money still to all these foreigners in its colonies. Now, um, what is interesting is that in 1792, uh, the Danish government is going to announce that it will uh, abolish its slave trade with effect from 1803. At that point, uh, they say, so in 1792, they're gonna say extend new loans to these same planters uh, so that they can purchase more slaves and sort of stock up on slaves before they abolish the slave trade. 
Now, um, I've only started looking at, at who actually takes up these loans, but what's interesting is, and I, as I look uh, at papers in the, uh, in the British National Archives, is that we see again that um, uh, when the British come in and they occupy the Danish West Indies during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, lots of these planters uh, start petitioning the, 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 the British crown about these uh, old Dutch loans that are now sort of uh, merged with these uh, loans for, for slaves. All right, at the same time, I'm sort of um, also thinking, so where, where is the Dan Danish money getting all, uh, Danish government getting all this money from to extend all these loans? And what's interesting um, uh, is that studies actually show that through the 18th century, but particularly in the late 18th century, uh, the Danish crown is a huge um, borrower of money from the same Dutch cap uh, uh, capital markets that they has tried to purchase the loans from, from it, uh, the, the, the colonial uh, planters. Um, so um, I, I'm just gonna uh, read my uh, conclusion to the paper to, to wrap up. So uh, the way I conclude the paper is to say it's, uh, it's ever tempting to end this paper with another French observation um, because as Louis XVI asked of his people during the French Revolution, what remains to the king but a vain shadow of royalty? So the Danish king could have asked what remains to the king but the vain shadow of empire? Was he like the fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen, an emperor with no clothes, clothes leading an empire that had the resemblance of prestige and prominence, but was all but a joke to those who paused to observe. When we follow the money, it's tempting to suggest as much. But a stroll through the streets of present day Copenhagen nonetheless reminds us that wealth from the Danish West Indies followed into the pockets of Danish merchants, certain uh, uh, captains, investors and traders as much as into foreign ones. Beautiful buildings on Christian's Town, exotic 18th century paintings and traces of sugar refineries leave little doubt that some rigorous calculation had indeed taken place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now for the last paper of our gathering today, and I'm kind of amazed we could do all 12 of these papers today. <laughs> um, I'll introduce Brett Rushforth who is an associate professor at the University of Oregon. And he, I think, wins the prize for the worst air quality of any of our panelists today. Um, he has a wonderful book called Bonds of Alliance, Indigenous and Atlantic Slaveries in New France, among other publications. And his paper today is Rebel Slaves, Rebel Planters, Informal Economies and Negotiated Power in the French Caribbean. Brett. Okay, that should, uh, this I hope is going to uh, do the share screen thing properly. Are we all seeing my screen? You can see my screen, yes? Okay. Yes, we can. Excellent, okay. sorry. Um, okay, so, you know, thank you to Molly and Carla and to the Huntington and to everybody here. It's been a great conference. I, I want to be uh, as quick as I can because I know everyone's fatigued and you know, you've read my paper or you haven't, but um, you probably, uh, at least, it's, it's a pretty quick story to tell. Brad, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It looks like the presentation is not yet in slide, slide uh, presentation mode. It isn't. So just go ahead and click that and then you'll be good to go. Oh, there we go. Is that? Okay. That's Thank great. You. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. So... Um, I came across a set of documents about 10 years ago in the um, Archive National du Tomer in Aix-en-Provence. I was looking for something else as often happens and I came across a set of interrogations that, uh, after, that had happened after an attempted rebellion uh, by a group of about 200 enslaved and maroon people, um, some free people of color. Um, and uh, I was immediately struck by how much detail there was in these documents about sort of the day-to-day -day existence of these informal exchange economies of life outside the plantation and of uh, sort of snapshots of how enslaved people, how maroons, how, you know, escaped slaves and of course free people of color had created these uh, sort of almost entirely invisible um, 
uh, networks of trade and, and relationships and family. Uh, it turns out there were religious uh, elements to this as well, which I'll get into in a second. But I was struck really uh, immediately that this might be a way for me not to really understand a rebellion, but to understand this community, to understand the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the things that we rarely get to see, particularly in early Martinique, there's very little in terms of documentation of people of African descent and their lives outside the plantation. Most of the secondary literature, particularly up to about the 1750s, um, talks a lot about the production of sugar. It talks a lot about demographics. It talks a fair amount about the internal politics of the French Revolution, or the French, not the French Revolution, uh, the French Empire, um, but very little about um, what enslaved people uh, you know, did on a day-to-day -day basis who they had relationships with, how they uh, made a living uh, when they escaped, etc. And so I thought it was a great opportunity. Um, the rebellion uh, in 1710 um, was, uh, it came to be known by the name of the Gaule. Um, and uh, you can see right here, uh, the Gaule is, in this case, um, uh, in the case of the 1710 rebellion, it, it refers to an, a secret society and potentially a dance that would allow you to join the secret society, uh, probably with Igbo roots. Um, potentially, it, it comes from the term gawaolu, which is they who wear the necklace, because there was a secret uh, sort of coral necklace that you would wear underneath your clothes uh, to signal that you were part of this secret society. Um, and over the course of the sort of spring and early summer of 1710, this secret society gathered people from all over the island. In one case, the uh, witnesses suggest that there were people from 50 different locations, 20 different maroon settlements, all of which were very, very small, um, and then as many as 30 different um, uh, uh, you know, uh, plantations. Um, and the, the spread of this um, uh, network across the island, of course, then converges into a uh, failed rebellion. Uh, you see in, in 1710, shortly after it happened, uh, the governor of Martinique says they discovered a conspiracy. Um, it turns out that it was not just a conspiracy. There were, in fact, actual attacks, including on the uh, plantation of the Intendant. Um, one of uh, the main leaders of the, of the group was a former enslaved person um, on that plantation and had led a group to attack the Intendant's property. Um, and so one of the ways to look at this, of course, is just to think about it as an example of slave rebellion. You look at, you know, what are the factors that created this rebellion? You know, in this case, it's, you know, demographic growth, right? You have from 1660 to 1710, a massive expansion of enslavement, um, a massive uh, increase in the production of sugar and the violence it took to extract that labor from unwilling workers. Um, and then, of course, all of the various things that go along with that. You have mobility uh, that is increased. Um, if you look at the map of Martinique, as it was expanding, many of the new plantations were over on this side of the island. And so it's building out of roads, the, the transportation of building materials, the transportation of uh, foodstuffs, of, um, you know, the, the you know, tools, et cetera. And that became a way for enslaved people to move about the island um, in a way that they could sort of use that traffic for cover. It would seem as quote unquote legitimate traffic, right? So they could be moving around the island and people wouldn't necessarily stop to ask questions because there was already so much movement. Um, this off offered opportunities for people to engage in trade. Uh, there are these networks that, um, uh, were, you know, sort of the exchange of vegetables and the exchange of uh, things from the plantation where they would go and meet with friends and family, exchange goods. Um, and then there were things that were exchanged in the city as well. So things from the ports. And all of this happened really under the uh, sort of in the open in some ways, because uh, everybody was uh, sort of melding into this uh, otherwise uh, sort of sanctioned movement. Uh, this it obviously calls to mind uh, Simon Newman's Hiding in Plain Sight from William Mary Corley a couple of years ago. And it also uh, suggests something similar to what um, Shauna Sweeney has found in Jamaica, uh, this market marinage, where the, one of the things that allows the sort of either sort of short-term or longer-term uh, escape from 
uh, the violence of slavery is the ability, especially of women, but in this case, both women and men, uh, to engage in commerce in the island. And of course, it also uh, calls the question of um, these archival silences. And one of the ways to look at this, of course, is this is an, a moment where the archival silence is broken. Um, and these interrogations, of course, under terrible circumstances and with great violence, extract these, uh, these confessions from people. Um, but one of the things that emerges from this and that I've argued in an article last year was that these Archival silences, we generally think of, of course, as ways of mapping power, thinking about the ways that uh, the power of plantation owners, the power of colonizers, uh, silenced uh, people of African descent. And in this case, the silencing was in many ways sought by the people of African descent who uh, wanted to stay outside of the surveillance networks and therefore outside of the archive. Um, they probably wouldn't have framed it, of course, as like, I'm trying to stay out of the archive. Um, but the things that they were attempting to do were obviously these uh, sort of uh, strategic silences, um, as I've called them elsewhere. Um, so this is the sort of way that I've thought about this first rebellion. It's not so much as the rebellion, uh, but much more as a window onto this um, really uh, interesting and fluid network of mostly non-enslaved people. So the title, as you can see, Rebel Slaves, Rebel Planters, the Rebel Slaves part is meant to be uh, undermined a little bit by the analysis that many of them were not enslaved. Most of them uh, found ways to, to um, uh, exist for big portions of their life outside of the strictures of slavery. Um, and uh, the rebellion in many ways was uh, sort of to maintain their freedom rather than to create it uh, for many of them. Um, just a, another thing that this allows us to do is to see into the individual lives of enslaved people. Uh, for instance, you see Andre who had a, a small gang of uh, supporters who would raid these uh, supply chains that were going from one side of the island to the other. Eventually he was caught and because he pulled a sword and wielded it against a Frenchman, he was uh, seen as especially dangerous. And this was uh, early in 1710, just a few months before the main rebellion. Uh, we also see people like Francois Pichon, who is a healer and um, he uh, has uh, many of the characteristics. It just reminds me a lot of uh, you know, what you'd see in many other colonies uh, with people who are drawing upon West African traditions of religion, but also mapping some elements of Catholicism into it. Um, and Francois is one of the key spiritual leaders of this uh, rebellion. Um, you have Madeline, who is actually an enslaved woman belonging to the Ursulines, the nuns that live in St. Pierre. And uh, she and many other enslaved women and men would make these secret necklaces that people would wear to signal their uh, membership in the, in the rebellion. Another interesting uh, story here is this, uh, there's a militia captain by the name of Ambroise de Loré, who uh, was sort of a minor colonial official um, and his job, in fact, his only job was to search out and recover escaped slaves. Um, instead of doing that, he hired them and he, among many others, created this network of what we, we can't call free labor, of course, because there is the threat of turning them in and, and returning them to slavery. Uh, but it was sort of a semi free labor because the people uh, hiring also were uh, violating the law. So they sort of had this uh, tense relationship, but it did provide for ways that uh, people who had escaped slavery could make a living and could uh, gather things. But it also meant that this uh, Delore was uh, choosing to be part of this network rather than uh, to be part of the, the state that had sanctioned, you know, his position and that was paying his salary. Um, the reason that, that the the second rebellion uh, that happens just uh, seven years later is called the Galay. is is kind of an interesting story. It's in the paper. I won't spend too much time on it here. But the second rebellion is a planter rebellion. It's largely very wealthy people, uh, minor colonial officials and planters. Uh, there's a new governor in Antendant who come to the island in 1717 and they uh, bring with them a decree that they have to stop expanding sugar, no new plantations or no new uh, sugar mills. Um, are to be allowed in Martinique. And more importantly, they have to stop trade with non-French islands. And because these networks of smuggling and illicit trade 
um, were really central to the um, informal exchange economy that uh, sort of supported the French side of this, uh, you know, the, of the island, um, or the French, you know, the French people in the island. Um, they also rebelled. So yes, there are some planters who rebel because they want more sugar uh, to be you know, planted in Martinique. But the main body of rebels were in fact like poor whites or militia members or militia captains, maybe at the highest. And they were mostly interested in stopping these restrictions on inter-island trade, inter-imperial trade. Um, these two rebellions, of course, have been treated very separately. Um, they're treated as, you know, on the one hand, a, 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 an example of enslaved people and the sort of failed rebellions that we hear about many times. The uh, planter rebellion is seen as this uh, window onto the French state, um, and not an especially uh, complicated one. You know, some people have uh, refer to it as the Bacon's Rebellion of uh, Martinique, which is absurd, but anyway, it's a, it's a formative rebellion that then has real implications for the nature of the French state. And what I want to do in this book eventually, if I could have had archival time this summer, I would have been able to say more, um, is to try to figure out, to show ways that the rebellion in 1717 and the rebellion in 1710 were more or less about the same thing. They were about trying to maintain informal economies, trying to maintain uh, the kind of networks that had brought you know, each of these groups into uh, relationships that were not separate, in fact. Because of course, when uh, uh, French planters and French uh, traders were moving goods, they were doing so with the enslaved labor uh, that they were controlling. And that the independence that they sought to protect was predicated, of course, upon the violent exclusion and the violent uh, sort of uh, stolen labor from uh, enslaved people. Uh, the, the final thing I'll, I'll mention before I stop is just to say that uh, in the, the name of the Second Rebellion, we can see, I think, a little bit of a hint about some of the connections between these two things. Um, the name of the Second Rebellion was drawn from the name of the first. And it was a situation where there was a group of enslaved men, they were talking, and the wife of one of the rebels, one of the white rebels in 1717 heard them talking to each other. And one of them said, you know, great troubles are coming, the bequet, it's a, a Creole word for, uh, for Creole, uh, white, uh, white Creole. Uh, they're gonna have a gaulet like we did. Um, and the idea then, of course, is that for the last seven years, there have been stories circulated around about this uh, rebellion and that the analogy was drawn between the sort of protection of independent economies, the protection of uh, sort of their own set of regulations that didn't map onto colonial or imperial aims uh, were, was going to be fought for by the, the French as well. Um, we could say a lot more about the sort of historiography that I talked about in the paper, but I think that's probably enough to end and we'll just, uh, we'll stop there because I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Brett. Well, this was a really interesting panel where I think we're, all the speakers are asking us to think differently about um, established narratives, whether rebellions that are happening among white and black communities are in some ways more connected or more parallel than we would normally think, whether the economies of empire, even if they seem not to be working as well as the imperialists like, are really um, as unprofitable as, as sometimes is claimed. And then um, Pablo asking us to think about how do we even conceptualize categories like science when we're carrying them to other to other eras and other ways of thinking? How do we get away from our our established understanding of what that means. So I'm sure there's lots of interesting questions. And first I'll ask if anybody on the panel has uh, particular things they would like to uh, raise around any of these three papers. Okay, I don't. I'm fatigued. Um, so I think there's a question in the uh, chat for Pablo. So Steve, do you want to go there? Sure, absolutely. So this is from uh, Elisa Peterson, and she's asking Pablo to elaborate on the relationship between uh, his work 
and Londa Schiebinger's Secret Cure of Slaves, especially the ways in which, uh, despite being seen as racially inferior, enslaved Americans experimented on the West Indies uh, were still used interchangeably when recommending uh, medicine for whites. So could you position your, your work in relation to Londa? Absolutely. I mean, my, my first book, um, as, as uh, was mentioned this morning, is it's an exploration of uh, uh, basically the word that the uh, people of African descent created in the Caribbean in the 17th century, a word in which they were actually the authorities in terms of healing health practice and exploration of the natural world. So in a way, the experiential Caribbean goes beyond what Londa is proposing here, which is an exploration of how those were the work of people of African descent or Amerindians is being incorporated into an European natural project, or it is being used in the process of plantation by white settlers. Um, so I'm just going to say that that is, that is how uh, these, uh, these two books uh, uh, kind of uh, are related. And uh, I think it is, uh, it is very important to recognize the, certain, the process that, uh, that Londa is uh, pointing out to, in both in, in her latest book, uh, but also in works like uh, previous works like Acnotology, right? Like, when she's talking of the violent process through which right, like uh, European epistemologists have obscured the knowledge pra making practice and the knowledge of both Amerindians and uh, people of African descent. Uh, what I'm saying in this new project is that uh, that is not enough and that there is a risk. I'm saying that this is not important. I think that we need to acknowledge that, but also acknowledge that in recognizing those practices, right? Like, it might be a way of saying, yeah, that is good enough. We are recognizing the problem that it has. And I'm saying that the ways in which science itself is built, the practices around which we think our own histories, right? Like the practices around which we construct the narratives about the realities of the past are built on also very violent epistemological practices, right? Uh, some of which are informed as I'm just using here, the research that I'm doing right now, uh, I'm trying to trace a history that we usually think about uh, the histories of, again, the creation of numbers, percentages, ideas of epidemiology risk. Again, things that we have been talking about throughout the last months. We should trace that history to North American European learning circles, to the um, to histories about the tables of morbidity and mortality in London, uh, to the histories of political economy. Uh, in other words, histories that are pretty much centered around a certain kind of learned European trajectory. And what I'm saying is, well, the first people and these ideas are actually emerging from a place that is far more closer to that colonial project, to that project of violence, to that project that it is basically immersed in the ways in which you construct many of things into economic institutions that gave rise to imperialism and colonialism. But I'm not talking about those things that we recognize as being abhorrent, like racism. I'm not talking about eugenics, which I think that we know happen with science. I'm talking about the very basic epistemological ways in which we think again about things like how to calculate disease in populations. How do you think about groups and in groups in terms of risk? And I'm saying, well, those practices thinking and conceiving of, of, of these notions are actually emerging first and foremost in the slave trading markets already by the end of the 16th century and at the beginning of the 17th century, almost a century before this is happening in Northern Europe. So I think that that is a step forward. And the way I was trying to frame it as a frame it in the paper is that if we kind of go that way, we also kind of are trying to, 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 to make this a similar kind of move to what many people that have been working on the history of capitalism and slavery has been asking us to do uh, lately, which is, it is not enough to say, yeah, the, oh, those slave societies were horrible. No, we ourselves, our own world is built on the profits of, and, and the structures of those societies. And uh, it's, those are two different positions to take. That is what I was trying to, to do here. So I don't know if that answered the question, I hope. And I think in a really interesting way, your last remarks lead right into what uh, Pernella was talking about. So I wonder if Pernella has any comments about that whole question of, I mean, one of the most striking things I thought about your paper was the way that you get to the, to the avenue and say, you know, clearly there was wealth coming and, and, um, you know, it was making a difference in this place that they had these colonies in spite of all the ways it wasn't working out that everyone 
you know, had hoped it was. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about that, that tension between really high expectations, what the results are, and then what the reality is of, of the wealth coming in, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it, it's interesting because it's not like when they start out that they plan on pulling in on all these foreign resources and people they would like to establish in their colonial uh, empire and their system, uh, according to the structures that we often refer to as sort of mercantilist. Um, but immediately they realize that they can't, right? And so to even establish their, uh, the, their uh, East India and then West India company, they have to rely on expertise from Euro Europeans, from the Dutch uh, capital. And when we come to the colonies, they also immediately realize they would like to settle based on, on people coming from within the confines of the Kingdom of Denmark, Norway, but they can't. So they have to bring in all these period people, particularly with experience in the, um, in the other colonies that knows how to set up plantations and so on, right? So it's sort of like very quickly, they have these dashed dreams and then they sort of resettle and have to figure out how to do it. And also periodically, they try to sort of return to a sort of more monopoly structures and again and again and again, it fails, right? But then they start combining it with these kinds of free ports that they have um, at St. Thomas, right? And so they, they sort of become more and more sort of aware that there are other ways in which that they can, they can navigate all this. And of course, they're inspired in some ways by the Dutch um, as well. So, uh, so um, the, the, the point about then there is some, some capital coming in is because we, we can see, and in, in, in Denmark, we haven't really gotten uh, anywhere near where we have in, uh, in the historiography, for instance, on the British Empire and exploring the impact on empire on the metropole. And also just, for, for instance, Catherine Hall's project about tracing the money and where, where it was reinvested and so on. We don't have that, but we are aware of what buildings, uh, you know, some of the buildings were built uh, with the money and profits coming in from the West Indies. Uh, 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 so there is sort of emerging signs of this. We have, of course, um, uh, paintings that illustrate uh, 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 the wealth coming in from, from uh, global and Caribbean trade. And we have, of course, these images that you see throughout Europe with the nobility. Um, they like to, to pose with little uh, enslaved uh, children from Africa, right? So we, there are all these signs and it sort of want to tell this story also about uh, uh, colonial wealth. Um, so, so, so I haven't been able to yet sort of determine, and I don't know if it's even possible yet to determine, you know, how much were they profiting, but there's certainly signs uh, all over if you start digging that they did. But of, of course, it's, it's not at the same scale as you see, for instance, in the, in the British context or for Saint-Domain for, for to take the French one. So do we have other questions from the yes. panel? There Justin. Oh, sorry, Justin, go ahead. Uh, Pernell, I've always been struck in the Danish case um, by what seems to me to be two contradictory movements. On the one hand, we have Danish abolition in 1803, the first, the first European state to abolish the slave trade. On the other hand, we have these massive loans in 1792 that are designed to stock their islands with the enslaved. And we see, if you look at the slave trade, you see this rapid rise in the slave trade after 1792. I mean, it's, that's, that's the vast majority of the slaves coming in the 18th century come on, on, the, on the backs of these Danish loans. In fact, so high that the planters themselves are, I think they're only stocking the islands with roughly half the slaves are bringing over. The other half are being sent off to, to other European nations, to, to Saint-Domingue and so on. So, so how, do we, how do we reconcile those, those seeming contradictions? Because it's when the Danish government makes its decision to abolish the slave trade that it turns around and says, here's money. Here's, here's money to bring in as many slaves as you can. Yeah. It thrives of, uh, on contradiction, I would say, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I use it as yeah. an example of class. It seems to be one of the most puzzling moments in this whole story of abolition. Yeah. Well, I, maybe it, this is a case where we think it's about altruism or something, and there's a different thing going on there. It might be exactly what Pablo is talking about for a different category of thought. Yeah. Just throw that out there. <laughs> I've, I've actually, thank you for the question. I, I tried to address this in an article I wrote about that's called Why the Danes Got There First. And basically it's because I've sort of grown up with this narrative that the Danes were the first to abolish the slave trade and aren't we great? And then I sort of was 
are we really? And we're sort of digging into why it was that that happened. And my perspective is that there's sort of a whole combination of things, but a lot of it is also that um, uh, the, the Danes at that point in time were just sort of reading the, the, where the things were going. They wanted to get there first uh, and they didn't have much to lose because they're giving this 10 year grace. They know that, that the British are uh, already having serious discussions about the abolition of the slave trade, but they also know that, that these planters are getting lots of their slaves through this inter-Caribbean networks of, uh, that we um, are learning about right for, through the slave trade. So the question is how much do they actually stand to lose at this point, right? So they promise the planters, you can have loans so you can uh, purchase as many slaves as you need, right? And then um, um, hopefully they can get it through other avenues subsequently. So to just, just one quick follow-up question. I see so much in uh, um, the Danish government's decision about how they're trying to create a self-sustaining enslaved population in, uh, they, in the they, Danish islands. Do they, do they actually sincerely believe that this is going to be possible? If they, if they just bring in enough Africans, they'll, they'll create this self-sustaining population? They do because um, one of so the the plantation owner known as Schimmelman that I showed you on the map, his yeah. son, both he and his son become finance ministers, and the son is really one of those who, you know, some historians say is in a very earnest way, really uh, out of his uh, sort of like um, enlightenment ideas, want to abolish the slave trade. But he is at the same time this huge plantation owner with several plantations throughout the Danish West Indies, and he claims to have done these sort of reforms where. Um, uh, and, and they talk about it across Europe uh, through um, uh, uh, Vastrom's publications, uh, the Swedish, you know, that is published in England and it's translated into French about how Schimmelman has done these experiments where he's shown that you can actually have your local uh, uh, enslaved populations naturally re reproduce themselves. So they believe in those experiments. And then, of course, at the same time, they're doing what the French and the English are doing also in West Africa, trying to sort of think about ways to relocate the whole production of sugar to West Africa, right? So all of this sort of is happening in, in, in combination and sort of leads to them um, deciding to go ahead with the abolition of the slave trade. So paradoxically, we could call the increase in the slave trade in the 1790s an amelioration movement. <laughs> well, um, how so? I mean, it's, it seems to be an <laughs> yeah. decision to bring in enough slaves to make everyone self-sustaining before the slave trade ends. And so this decision to increase the slave trade just seems this really odd moment when that's the amelioration move. I, 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 don't, I don't understand. I, I, think that, I think that's more to calm down the, the planters than actually, yeah, yeah. I also want to say the 18th century is hijacking us again here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, let me hand it over to Molly, who I think has a question for me. Actually, Brad. I'm going to pass the mic to Gabe, who I know has been trying to get in here. Oh, sorry, Gabe, I didn't see you. Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry, I can, okay. Um, thank you. I, I, I have a question uh, for Brett that kind of is informed by the discussion and the papers, uh, the other papers on the panel. Um, I was wondering, you know, in, this might be kind of my, my own ignorance in terms of like the literature, the, the really large uh, scholarly corpus on risk um, and empire um, and like economic history. But I wonder if, you know, my sense is that where that's talked about, uh, risk is talked about from the perspective of power and of capital uh, and the sort of like the, the loss in the, uh, in, in the profit margin that, that would result from uh, things that would go adversely for the, the powerful. Um, and, uh, and so I wonder in your discussion of these, uh, these insurgencies, um, which I think you know, is a term that kind of conveys a more open-ended uh, set of considerations, um, I wonder if uh, there's, a, there's a way or if it's useful to kind of think of a bottom-up approach to risk um, from the perspective of the enslaved, free people of color, people who are involved in these informal economies and whether they perceive the risk, they have to weigh the risk between, you know, these, these new uh, dictates on the, the constraint of, uh, of new economic channels, uh, or, you know, more, and, and on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, just direct confrontation with that, that might, you know, offer other types of pitfalls for them. So if there's an opportunity for you to engage in this, these ideas of risk and these concepts of risk, but from a different type of perspective than uh, that might be sort of predominant in the literature. 
Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. I mean, the, obviously those calculations are being made, they're being discussed. Where you see them the most is when uh, the people who are caught and interrogated at the end of the rebellion, they're asked about this question they're obsessed with is why did you take this risk? I mean, they, they don't say it in those exact terms, but they're like, why would you risk your life? You know, what did, what did you do? And of course, one of them, you know, she said, my master burned my house down. I had to run away because he wanted to kill me. And that's where the risk of running is obviously lower than the risk of staying um, there are other cases, though, where um, people kind of went back and forth from various uh, or, you know, across various boundaries. So uh, one man by the name of um, Michaud, uh, who uh, he ran away with the original group, but then he kind of ends up becoming a little bit of an outcast in that group. And so he goes and works for this militia officer, this militia captain, develops friendships there. And then the militia captain himself is trying to make these risk assessments too, right? So uh, Michaud has to decide whether or not he's going to take the risk of uh, going to work on the cacao plantation of the person in his district who is charged with capturing him, right? It's a really dangerous thing to do. Um, but then, of course, he also threatens this uh, militia captain, and that can sort of like leverage the risk that the captain himself is taking. And so I don't think that there's, you know, I'm not really a big fan of the sort of version of this risk literature that is economically driven, uh, mostly because it's, it's either really obvious, like, you know, people are going to do what profits them, um, or it ends up being too abstracted from social relations. Right. Um, and I think here you have a really embedded uh, set of assessments. Um, and, you know, I think that if you, if you go to the, the period of you know, 1717, the second rebellion, um, enslaved people actually are supporting a planter rebellion designed to uh, overturn restrictions on more sugar plantations. And it seems on its face to be a very strange decision. Um, but really what it is, is not about obviously the expansion of sugar, but it's about the preservation of these networks of independent trade. And so they are willing to take, you know, that kind of position, even though you know, from, from a sort of uh, a standpoint of looking sort of aerially at it, um, it doesn't make much sense that they would be supportive of fight for risk their lives for these planters who are rebelling against the limitation of planting. Great. Molly? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, everybody, for great papers. Uh, I'm, I'm also quite mindful that um, Pernilla, at least, is nine hours ahead of us, so heroic efforts on her part to stay a part of the conversation. Um, I have a sort of comment question for Brett and also a bit for Justin, and I was thinking here, maybe this is sort of segueing into our, our final concluding discussion in a way, um, of Sasha's paper and what it raised, questions it raised for me about periodization. And when I was hearing you talk, Brett, and also thinking back to Justin's paper, I was thinking of two really good new books on the so-called Amboyna Massacre of 1623, one by Adam Clulo and one by Allison Games. And both scholars do really wonderful work uh, thinking about how we've told the story of that event. And I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look at these two books, but I think you'd be interested in them. And for me, I mean, they're, they're really wonderful tellings of a, of a sort of famous story famous for early modernists. Um, and they think about the ways in which the archive and the political machine of the time has sort of distorted and ossified the way that we tell that story uh, in our classrooms and in our scholarship. And I think it's been, it's been on my mind recently because even though it takes place far from the Caribbean, it is, as Justin points out, and is profoundly relevant for you, Brett, really tied into the, the sort of global political machinery of these early modern empires. And I think it just is um, an example of how it can be useful for us to um, go outside, you know, it's first of all, just to leave the confines of a single empire, but also to leave a single region and then just think about the historical processes and also the historiographical processes that have shaped the way that we narrate the transformations and uh, turning points in the regions that we focus on. And I was relating this in my head to Sasha's paper in the sense that, Sasha, I felt that you were pushing us to think once again beyond the typical boundaries of Caribbean history, which for many <laughs> obvious and good reasons often ends, at least in how we teach it in our classroom, at um, emancipation 
But in many ways, I think the phenomenon that you're describing of a certain type of um, gendering, racializing and gendering professions continues far beyond that particular point. And so that we see the legacy of, as you were pointing out, of, um, of really sinews of how the modern world functions being laid in the early Caribbean um, and that continue to shape the modern world as we know it far beyond the period in which we sort of tend to stop telling a certain narrative of Caribbean history. So I guess all of this rambling point is to say, hey, if you haven't seen these two books on Amboina, I think they'd be really interesting to, um, to check out. But also to just add here that even though, um, you know, this conference has largely focused on the Caribbean, I think there's still a lot of resonances in how important it is for us to look elsewhere, temporally and geographically, and find points that can really um, have real resonance for us as we, as we tackle these Caribbean complexities. Good comment and maybe question. Does somebody want to um, respond to that? I don't know uh, if anyone has seen those two books, if, if you guys I, haven't. I have Allison's book. I, I haven't read it yet. I haven't had time. But um, I mean, the point you make about sort of the, the way that uh, stories are told, both at, you know, at the time of these events and then afterward, and how the, this, the, the ways that archives are structured, obviously, but also the way that sort of power relationships uh, structure uh, even how a, what a story is, if that makes sense, right? I mean, what, what it counts as a story. Um, you know, those are the kind of questions. I mean, I was like actually thinking of Josh Piker's Four Deaths of Acorn Whistler, mm -hmm. which uh, reminds me a lot of these questions where it's, it's about, um, you know, these different perspectives on the same event, none of which we can really, uh, I don't know, imbue with much more authority than the other, but it's in the ways that they're incommensurable that we see the power structures um, and we see things that we otherwise couldn't see about um, sort of how incentives work and how uh, you know, people manipulate this system. Are there other follow-up comments or questions to? Just a plug for Alison's book, which was first begun on a fellowship at the Huntington. So do think about applying and writing your next book at the Huntington. Closing date, November the 15th. Yes, and it's a it's a great book. Um, I have actually read it. So, um, okay. Well, it seems like um, let's let's ask Steve really quickly to look at the chat and see if there's anything pressing from this session, which is just about to end, um, that he wants to bring in from the Q and A, and then we can move to our more general discussion if there isn't, or if we can get through those. Okay, so there's uh, one question for Pablo. It's quite specific, and I'm not entirely sure that I'm understanding it. But it, really, the question is about the relationship between logics of quantification in Europe and those that are indigenous or Afrocentric, um, particularly Yoruba quantification, or excuse me, Yoruba quantification methods. I don't know whether you'd like to comment on that. Yes, I. I, I... And I think I know where this question is coming from. So, uh, but I will say, uh, yes, that I'm very interested. This is one of the things that I am, uh, uh, that I'm also trying to get at. Is, and this actually relates to one comment that I had about the, the question that I was supposed to bring uh, in terms of the idea, ideas about risk, right? Like, it is how people in this world, they enter with their own understandings of how both the world is quantified, how risk operates in their own worlds. And, but, is not only that they carry the, those ideas with them through the long history of the, of, of the slave trade and living in the slave society, slave society with the slaves, uh, but also that they're starting incorporating the logics, right? Like under which they're operating for their own benefit, right? Like so, it works both ways, right? Like so, uh, in, in in answer to the question about uh, these specific sort of uh, epistemolo epistemological quantification, I think they be they become super important in the ways in which. It, it, so groups of people of African descent within uh, Caribbean societies, for instance, start thinking about their own uh, groups and how they think they operate within their own societies. So, um, so it's, it's, it's part of that kind of harder to grasp. And the, the, the history that I'm interested in, uh, histories of 
knowledge production around numeracy that also disappear. And uh, I have to say, for instance, that Jennifer Morgan is also working on a, on a very interesting project asking us these very same questions. So um, I think that there's a lot of interest in, in, in precisely that, uh, the question that was posed, yeah. Terrific, thank you. So hey. if we're transitioning into the closing discussion, can I invite those members of the uh, audience who are still out there, if you've got more general comments or questions that you'd like to throw into the Q&A during this last session, please do so. But otherwise, over to Carla and Molly. Yes, well, here I would hope to see us follow up on the kind of comment that Molly just made and think about how we would connect the various things that we're doing. So um, I don't have really specific questions, in, uh, although I could come up with some if I'm needed in that role. But I just wanted, I mean, one thing I was thinking about listening to all the papers is various other ways we would have, could have combined them. And we could have had a like five or six panel paper panel on mm -hmm. just on maroons and that whole phenomenon. And so we didn't necessarily have conversations that went across those lines when we were in the specific section. So we could, you know, we could talk more generally about those issues. There's also, I mean, there's all, there's so many kinds of connections, um, getting Chantelle and Melissa to connect, um, you know, Justin's talking about disease and so in a way, um, you know, disease and bodies and so in a way are Pablo and Sasha. So I'm just hoping we can have um, a more general discussion, or we can go back to my favorite, which is why does the Caribbean matter? and How is this a global space? So <laughs> on that note, I just wanted to say something that that is really always on my mind uh, and has been on my mind all day here too, which is just that historians, I mean, we never have a monopoly on truth telling to the degree that we try to tell the truth. Um, and we we just don't have a monopoly at all on the uh, the narration of the engagement with the cultural and intellectual uh, output of the Caribbean. It is such a profoundly rich region that has created its own history and told the story of its own history in so many different disciplines in so many different ways. And that was really a point that, um, I don't know, I came to just really understand deeply in a way that I hadn't before when I was finishing the work on my first book. Um, I, and I realized at a certain point, it's very humbling that as a historian, you can only you know, hope that you're even identifying just the tiny toe of the elephant and never the whole elephant. But it, but in the case of the Caribbean, I just at a certain point uh, took back, uh, you know, a deep breath of astonishment at just the, the, the level of cultural production and ways of grappling with Caribbean history that was not only unfamiliar to me, but that happened outside of the discipline of history. So I guess that to say that, you know, we are all here, I'm, I've been struck all day by what a rich, rich field this is of historical practice and of what important work everybody is doing and how important it is that we all talk with each other and read each other's work. So many wonderful scholars uh, out there. Uh, we have such wonderful comrades in this work far beyond the, the confines of this conference. But again, it's not just history. And, um, and I just wanted to sort of throw that out there as an acknowledgement that we can only hope to do so much. And even that we do imperfectly, even when we give it our best shot. And I just want to acknowledge that the Caribbean um, historians don't, don't have the last word just as much as we might like to. Just as a supplementary comment to that, there's a note in the Q&A here, uh, not so much about uh, the Caribbean as a rich site of cultural production, but the material culture that survives from it as well, and whether we might like to think about the material expressions of the various phenomena um, that uh, have been surfacing in the conversation today, uh, material culture which might exemplify notions of mobility, risk, informal economies, displacements, etc. I did a... Um seminar at the Huntington six years ago about the early modern Caribbean. Um, it was like an application in uh, graduate students, junior college, colleagues kind of event. And we actually did all three components of the Huntington. We did the research library, but we also did the gardens and the art and we went to all the curators and, and we actually took a great walk through the gardens and looked at all the Caribbean plants and talked about the different, you know, how they come to be in Southern California and, you know, their histories and their importance in the, you know, and it was kind of crowdsourcing from the whole group to talk about these different things. Um, so I think even at, at a place like the Huntington, which when I first started working, 
there in this area, I was told by a number of curators, oh, we never collected Caribbean stuff. <laughs> like, if you're collecting anything in this period, you were collecting Caribbean stuff because, you know, it's so central that everybody scooped it up. So, um, you know, I think that kind of the point about there being different ways in and different um, sources that we can look at, I think, is that was validated by that experience as well. So do any of the um, presenters have anything they would like to add or questions they would like to throw out to the group? Rob? Sure, I was just thinking about the materiality. I mean, I know that there's, um, you know, I, I always want archeologists to be doing more maroon uh, archeology span and that's an area that I know is growing and that uh, there's new evidence every day. But the other area that I think touches on a few things like, um, Gabe's work and, and mine, I didn't get to mention, but Montes are very important in what I'm doing too, is just how much is being done by like archeologists and like paleobotany, right? Trying to understand, you know, so there's, there's this moment and as far back as the 1960s, Carl Sauer pointed it out that because of the, the sort of decimation of indigenous populations, the sort of managed landscapes of the Taino or the Cueva disappeared, right? And so the, this ecological change and being able to find the work of experts that are doing uh, the sort of archeological studies that allow us to be able to track how, for example, you know, the savannas of, of Hispaniola or even the savannas of Panama or anywhere along the Southern Caribbean disappear and what's the rate of their disappearance and what replaces them um, just becomes incredibly useful uh, for the archival work that we're doing in terms of being able to track how people are talking about landscape, what people are in landscapes, um, how, you know, especially subaltern people can use landscapes for resistance because those landscapes have changed over the course of the period that we're looking at. Um, so that, that question about materiality and, and uh, physical evidence, I think, is really important. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, Certainly, I would love to hear from other people sort of where they are turning to, to find, um, you know, work in, in, in those sort of interdisciplinary ways to incorporate into their, their historical studies. So is anybody familiar with the work of Jonathan Finch on the archaeology of Caribbean slave plantations? He's based at Leeds in the UK. He's published a number of articles comparing historical archaeology of landed estates in the north of England with um, uh, sugar plantations in the Caribbean. Writes very lucidly. So um, if none of the presenters have anything they want to bring up at the moment, um, I would say, um, why don't we talk about, oh, Jesse, did you have something? Um, just, I mean, sort of hearing all the, the, the rich papers here today, I, I was thinking a lot about, um, I don't know whether this is sort of uh, uh, endemic to the Caribbean or, or facilitated by sort of the, the, the amount of different empires and, and um, racial and ethnic groups that are all in such close proximity or by the sort of as, as some of you are pointing out by the geography and, and, and um, uh, the ability to sort of move and and uh, escape and whatever by by water, right? But I think what I'm noticing in a lot of these papers is sort of the the extent to which a lot of us are trying to reconstruct kind of alternate or hidden kind of pathways, right? Be it um, maroon routes or um, intentional silences or um, you know amelioration of of uh, you know effects of of slavery via cola nuts or, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the ways in which, you know, planters are trying to paper over uh, discussions of maroons and things like that, right? Um, there's, there's so much that, that I think a lot of these papers are keying into uh, uh, that, that, that has to do with um, sort of counter narratives, right? And, and you know, I'm, I'm, to some extent, that's, that's what a historian does, right? But I think it's, it's accentuated here by uh, the extent to which um, uh, information is, 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 is supposed to be kind of uh, um, withheld, right? Or, or, or shared. 
Can we jump in? Yes, of course. <laughs> um, I just wanted to comment on, uh, on uh, and this is actually a question and, uh, that I had uh, one of, for one of the previous panels, but actually it kind of uh, dovetails very well into what Jesse saying and, and uh, the, the comments that Brett made before. And it is the fact that uh, one of the most interesting aspects, as Jesse mentioned, of, of the papers uh, today is, is that reconfiguration of our understanding of a history that seems to be settled around very specific parameters, right? Like, so it is a question about sources as both Carla and Molly are asking us to think with, right? And some of the comments is the use of uh, ethnohistory, of archeology, span of ethnography, or as Elena is suggesting, right? Like the, the collaboration of anthropologists and ethnographers today, but it's also a, a historical question and a question about, about the positioning of the Caribbean as a place where it's not only that modernity is as such, it kind of emerges uh, as a concept, as a concept, as a way of thinking about history. But I also, uh, what I'm hearing today is also reconfiguring what are the trajectories of, 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 of these so-called modernities and maybe they're not so modern after all. And, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because in the paper by Rob and by Brett, what you see is also that even the term maroon, it seems to be a misnomer uh, and our focus on, on, on fugitivity, right, as a concept, uh, when what you were seeing is actually the establishment of very powerful, in many ways, political actors in these regions that are kind of waiting for vacuums of space or vacuums of power to move on. And, and, and because the, the tr traditional histories and histories of the Atlantic specifically, also go back to what you asked in the, in the morning, Molly, right? Like, uh, uh, they're kind of around both imperial archives and imperial historiographies, national historiographies, the British, the Dutch. We fail to recognize this interaction that for most people in those spaces, living in what was Panama, the Northern New Kingdom of Granada, these are the real powerful actors in these regions. It's just they, they don't appear either in the archives but neither in the trajectories that we are thinking about or the kind of network that Gabe was talking about, the kind of informational network that inform how they're acting themselves, right? Like so, um, so it's very exciting work and that is, it's again asking us to think and go beyond those narratives. So uh, I just wanted to comment and follow up on what Jesse was saying. Good, is there anyone else who wants to jump in here? Uh, I, I'll jump in. Just to say that uh, I just really appreciate what everyone else has said and um, all day I've really been thinking about, I, I really appreciate Carla and Molly, the conversation you create between the 18th century as a kind of separate time and the 19th century in this earlier time period. And basically every paper I heard today, I thought about um, that divide and what it would be to take our case study from one side of the gap and connect with the work on the earlier time period and compare to it. Even uh, with Rob's paper, I was thinking about um, that next generation of Maroons in Cartagena and in Veracruz, Gaspar Yanga and um, ben Bencos Biojo, and even just uh, pulling our chronologies more broadly, what that can do. And the other thing that I've been thinking all day really is um, Anglophone conversations, uh, North Atlantic categories of analysis and like what we can do by moving back and forth. Like what are conversations that are happening in a more Anglophone way and why is that happening? Um, and what can Iberian or Danish um, or Dutch perspectives do to kind of unwind it? And that was another thought I had about um, Pablo's paper about this specific attention to the archive of the slave trade. So much has written and been written and spoken about the archive of slavery but to focus like you are on the archive of the slave trade, I think that's really fascinating. And also to bring us deeply into an Iberian world, um, the kind of, not that information that say the transatlantic slave trade database has extracted from the archives of the slave trade, but to, to really deeply ensconce us in a multiplicity of kinds of documentation produced by the slave trade in this early Iberian context that really adds so much to a conversation that's been happening in different frameworks. So there's a question popped up from Morgan Pierce uh, for all the scholars who are currently looking at Maroons. Do you feel that the division between Petit and Grand Marinage is still a relevant or productive categorization? I mean, I'll, I'll speak to this. I, in the French context, obviously, this is where it's come from. And it's, it's a, an important legal uh, 
differentiation that's made by uh, people wanting to punish people who escape. And so in some circumstances on a personal level, it makes a difference whether you're accused with one or the other. Um, I don't think that it really is a very clear uh, or very helpful way of thinking about how people's lives actually work. Because um, most people, in fact, almost all people have some sort of petit marinage, you know, as part of their, uh, of their life. Um, and a lot of it's serial marinage, right? So it's a bunch of, uh, you know, smaller acts of defiance and of absenteeism. Um, and, you know, grand marinage is something that it's, I don't know, I, I just, I don't think of it as a, an especially different uh, practice. You know, it's, it's something that you're still plugging into the same social networks, the same commercial networks, you're still, you know, growing the same vegetables and trading with the same people and um, the kinds of risks you take to leave for a week are similar to the kinds of risks you take to leave for a year, except for the potential punishment uh, because there's a legal difference. So to me, it's not this, but it's sort of like societies with slaves and slave societies, not an especially useful way of describing actually what's happening. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. In, in, in the article I, I did for Hispaniola, I point out that especially for the 16th century, it's almost impossible to discern, right? I mean, for the later periods, you know, when you have like runaway slave notices, it's sometimes easier. I actually think recently uh, Sylvie Diouf's book, Slavery's Exiles, it's looking at uh, maroons in, in, in North America and in, in 13 colonies US, I think does a better job about thinking about the, the sort of spaces that they're in vis-a-vis -vis, in particular the sort of plantation environment of the South and, and thinking about maroons who kind of go to the sort of liminal space at the edge of the plantation versus ones that go way far away to you know the the great dismal swamp right and and in my research that does appear to be a bit more of a useful dynamic slaves that are a bit more in what would be the petite marinage where they're kind of on the fringes of the sort of colonial world and they're maintaining kind of close connections to the people that may still be enslaved or free people of color that are there versus individuals who choose to flee far away and, and create entirely new settlements and constitute sort of entirely new subsistence bases. That's a useful distinction, but I don't necessarily know if it petit versus grand in that, that classical French late Caribbean way makes as much sense as just thinking about it spatially and then the social relations that map into those, those spatial arrangements. Uh. I want to jump in uh, on sort of um, following that and building on that thought. Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, and connecting it to the discussion on periodization, um, I wonder if, uh, you know, we can, one of the things that, um, that early modernists can, uh, can be thinking about uh, and, and Caribbeanists uh, as well, uh, early modern Caribbeanists is, you know, how how do we envision these kinds of these these bursts of uh, contingencies that that we're tracing and how they uh, and and the sources that we have to sort of unpack that and the sort of long durée ramifications of that uh, of of those contingencies um, and so you know in in my case like I'm I'm working on this earlier period and I have perhaps a, like a simplistic kind of uh, thing that I can say that this is a foundational moment that has these lasting consequences, um, and maybe that's that's too kind of uh, facile of a of a of a claim to make. Um, but but I wonder if you know in thinking about Pablo's kind of uh, uh, warning to kind of uh, to in uh, to to not sort of take for granted ideas of quantification, I guess I want to apply that to ideas of temporality themselves, as Pablo is, is asking us to do, and think about periodization as not something that kind of demarcates different periods of time on a linear scale, right? Of like, okay, well, there's like things that happen between the 16th, 17th century can be understood as one phase in the development of Caribbean history, followed by like 17th, 18th century, uh, 19th century developments, right? But, but if we can think like trans historically about like things that happen in a particular time that had these sort of structural ramifications that we feel that, that, we, that are part of the world today. Um, and so in a way it's like, it's, 
It's trying to get at what what I'm what it's is exciting to me about a lot of the uh, the conversations here is kind of uh, maybe thinking about uh, periodization in a way that gets out uh, gets beyond the uh, the linear kind of mode that we tend to think of it uh, and drawing from uh, non European uh, actors uh, categories for thinking through those different periodizations. So I wonder if like that that resonates or is helpful to others as well. Or... As, an out, as an outsider to the field, am I understanding you correctly? Are you implying that problems of periodization are more acute with respect to the Caribbean than they would be in other contexts? And if, and if so, why? I mean, I don't know. I don't know if uh, I don't know if I'm saying that. I mean, um, I, th I think yeah. there are particular kind of questions that come out of looking at the Caribbean. But you could say that the similar types of questions apply to other regions. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Just wonder. I've been mean, thinking about periodization. Um, I think of the sort of uh, just uh, what's the word I'm looking for iron cast grip that the notion of the 13 colonies had on a certain way of telling early American history for a very long time. Right. And it took a long time to shake people out of that, those, um, that sort of container of approaching a particular moment and place in history in a certain politically informed way. But then once people shook free of it, a whole new series of connections and conversations could take place. And I think, I mean, I can only speak for myself here, but I, I think that's why I find playing, even if sometimes, you know, the point is absolutely taken. Sometimes, you know, we really do lose local context if we go too broad. Sometimes the connections just aren't apt or aren't informative. But I do think that there, we have ample evidence that there have been moments in the past when we don't even realize how confined we are by certain types of um, temporal cages or geographic cages. And that for as, as improbable as it may seem, the very act of shaking the cage a little bit to see if it gives, can be really, really productive intellectually. So um, I don't know if that's more true of the Caribbean than elsewhere, but I think in general, it's an exercise that is just good for us historians to do. Uh, well, so I think also carrying that idea forward into the Caribbean, that 13 colonies, I mean, so much is written as national history. And the Caribbean is such a complex space now because of its, you know, its multilingual, multi-nation, you know, and it has these imperial legacies that are complex and then it, but then it also has this kind of environmental reality of how it fit into the, to European expansion and exploitation in ways that created similar, and some similarities across all of these different locations. So, I mean, that's one reason why I find this such a fascinating region is because, you know, how complicated it is both today and in the past, but then also what elements are, in, you know, held in common. Um, you know, so if you want to talk about, say, Marunage, which a lot of people have, I think we've seen from these papers, it's happening in a lot of different places. It's, it's not only African peoples, it's also Native peoples. Um, and it's happening at different on different time frames because of what local conditions are and how they're unfolding, um, you know. So there's, I mean, there's a there's a great complexity, but then in the at the same time, there's points of of contact and comparison that make it, you know, make it really fascinating. Now, Elena said her thing about you got to go to the place, which I realize I'm able to do, unless we're having a global pandemic partly because I'm in a very privileged position in the profession. But I do actually think going to the Caribbean frequently and seeing like how close these islands are to each other in many cases and, you know, or, or understanding how, you know, getting from point A to point B is harder than it looks in the 17th century because of what the currents are doing and the winds. And, you know, so I think, I think there's, I think it's a complicated environment in its day the day that I study because of all the interest in the region and all the different groups buffeting about. Um, but it continues to be a complicated and, and I think really fascinating space. So, you know, I don't think, I don't think that necessarily speaks to the temporal issue, but I do think it speaks to the, the, the fact of it as a global center of change and, 
you know, a place that's super dynamic all throughout its, you know, from 1500 on at least. Just on a very instrumental point, if either you or your graduate students do have an interest in following Elena's advice and going to these places, the Huntington has just uh, expanded its travel grant program, which was historically uh, restricted to the United Kingdom and Europe wow. to Latin America and the Caribbean. So we have six travel grants, each worth three and a half thousand dollars a month, and we'll pay the airfare as well. And we are offering them this year. Deadline November the 15th. Graduate students eligible. Okay. When can we travel with those grants? I guess is the question. What is the And anywhere outside the mainland United States. No, but when? Uh, oh Hi. yes, well, I, I can't answer that question. question. So the 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 budgetary question, or the answer to that question in budgetary terms, is after the first of July next year. All right. All right. Um. Can I raise a question? This question of periodization um, is is very interesting to me, partly because, as many people have mentioned, where you are. Uh, de depends obviously on what periodization you're talking about. You know, there are sugar plantations obviously in 16th century uh, Santo Domingo, um, but other places it doesn't happen until the 18th century. Um, I'm interested actually in, in the sort of size of the island. I mean, this is sort of a geographic question. I think it's really important in terms of Mahanaj, but it's also important in terms of, uh, you know, just in terms of sort of economic and um, I guess pathways for independence for um, all kinds of people. I mean, Gabe, we were talking about the difference between Sao Tome and uh, Santo Domingo. I mean, these are, I mean, the scale of those could not be more different, right? You know, Martinique, you know, the, the Maroons tend to settle in, you know, groups of about 20. Um, and many of them are settling on undeveloped pieces of their master's plantations. So they'll just go, you know, half a mile up and they'll clear out a, an area to, to start their gardens. Um, and they're relying on, you know, obviously, geographic knowledge. They're relying on the fact that there are a bunch of poisonous snakes there, there are all kinds of things that they rely on their knowledge. And, um, but it just has a fundamentally different dynamic than on, on saint uh, when you have you know, uh, much more space as well as going over the Spanish side of the island, but the mountains you have. You know, so it's just, I think, the, the, the scale of geography um, as well as the proximity of the smaller islands which has already been discussed, um, something we could maybe think about. Also, Jamaica to Cuba. <laughs> Pretty proximate there as well. So, do yeah, other people have something? Yeah. Um, is, well, I was thinking on that point, and I was going to say something earlier, but we kind of moved on. But um, I think Rob brought this up too this kind of like um, landscapes of resistance. Or I forget exactly how you put it, but something like that. Um, and like, in addition to size of islands, like is your Caribbean even an island, right? Like for maybe Jesse or Justin, or I know some of you are interested in like the Guianas or Venezuela, places that if you're thinking about trade or, you know, certain kinds of influences certainly are part of the Caribbean, but open up a whole new set of possibilities for, you know, abilities of indigenous peoples to kind of um, maybe more fully resist or certainly for people to, you know, abscond into a wilderness that Europeans are just like, complete, so, you know, so flummoxed by that they like think, you know, El Dorado's there until like 1950. Um, so I think that slight exaggeration, but not much. Um, but I think that like, not, I mean, I think like where, what is the Caribbean is may or may not be an interesting question, but I think certainly for those kinds of um, questions about marinage or resistance, that is another factor that I, I certainly find quite interesting. Other comments, observations? I was thinking about the African Atlantic perspective and pairing Pablo Brett, Gabriel's paper and my own, um, and how that balances Atlantic history and how also our perspective speaks to the globalness of the Caribbean and reflects how we all come to the Caribbean. I know I've come to the Caribbean through an African history perspective so I think that's really interesting to meditate upon. 
can I say one quick thing? I know we're running out of time, uh, but I also think it is it, it, it is very interesting to see like where we are in 2020, uh, using Whitley or not, or Whitley, their thoughts and the intellectual work of so many Caribbean scholars and thinkers. But it's also, I mean, uh, Elena mentioned uh, s several of them in, in, in the talk, and, and I, we can go on and think about like how that fractured space and uh, of, of the Caribbean, those fractured histories, there's, there have been so fruitful for the production of methodologies that are not only useful for the Caribbean, for a, that early modern Caribbean, but more generally for thinking about histories of both coloniality, post-coloniality, and decoloniality around the world. Uh, so it, it's just, I was just thinking as I was listening, uh, all of us talking, so kind of to pay homage to the people from the Caribbean who have been producing the kind of methodologies with which we are thinking today, right? Like, and, and that is pretty remarkable because I think it is also the nature of the region itself, right? Like that, 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 that allows people to germinate these sort of, uh, these sort of thoughts, right? Like throughout the 20th century uh, and, and even before 19th and 18th century. And many of the histories that are hidden uh, and, and those intellectual trajectories that uh, we have been trying to trace, right? So that's why I point that out. Justin. Uh, I've been thinking about uh, uh, Melissa's paper and thinking about her comments now about the sort of the expansion of the Guianas and whether or not we include the Guianas. And I suppose one of the things that always fascinated me is the extent to which in the 16th and the 17th century, uh, the Circum Caribbean will stretch up or down the American mainland. So you can think about um, uh, Jamestown being settled and being settled in part as a place from which the English can raid the Caribbean, right? So that they can be perched like these sort of parasitical pirates on the outside and they can swoop down and uh, raid the Caribbean. And of course, I mentioned the, um, uh, the enslaved being brought up to uh, uh, Jamestown for the first time uh, out of the Caribbean. And uh, it strikes me that, that, that it, it can expand and contract over time and, 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 and based on, on um, um, political power, I suppose, and how that's changing across the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and then, of course, I, I, I think it can expand outwards to, as I suggested in, in my work, even St. Helena on the other side of the Atlantic. We can think of this as almost like an island that the, the East Indian Company tra starts trying to treat like a Caribbean island. They say, look, we can do the same thing they're doing everywhere else in this, this Atlantic. Um, and then we think about the, how the Caribbean can expand again, then, as I said, to, uh, to, the, to the East Indies even, or the West Indies, at least in the, in the, in the conception of, the, or at least in the English mind. So, Melissa's paper when she talks about moving Caribbean crops up into the mainland and as far north as the New Netherlands. You know, I've come across a lot of evidence of, of uh, East Indies pepper and so on being brought over to Jamaica and they're trying to grow it there. You know, they're, they're, they're moving crops all around the globe, trying to recreate the Caribbean and trying to recreate the East Indies all around this globe. So this, this definition of, of how far the Caribbean reaches just changes constantly across time. So my students often ask me, what is a Circum Caribbean? I don't have a good answer for it. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't work. Right, well, that's the, one of the things about geographical frames that's always interesting to get students to think about another way to shake us up. I have to jump in here and say um, that we are rapidly losing panelists to um, <laughs> time zones, uh, child care and other issues that are cropping up. So um, though we could stay on half the night, as far as I'm concerned, I think we should probably thank the Huntington, thank everybody who's still here, um, whether they um, attended and asked questions or just listened in or whether they presented and just say how I was so skeptical this could be made to work on Zoom. And in spite of my early morning crash, I am actually quite pleased at how well it has worked out. So I just wanna thank everybody for their participation and the Huntington for making it possible. Absolutely, hear, hear. Um, there are still 54 attendees out there who've stayed with us all day. So many thanks to them and for their consistent interest in the discussions today. Uh, most obviously, uh, I'd like to thank Carla and uh, Molly the Huntington generally makes running a conference very easy from a logistical point of view. And that means that the conveners uh, face the intellectual challenge exclusively. That is, 
of putting the right people in the room for the programme. And I'm absolutely convinced that Carla and Molly have done just that. And that's why the conversations have been so rich today. So thank you on behalf of all of us to Mal Molly and Carla. Thank you all so, so much. It's been a wonderful day. Thank yes, you. Thanks to everybody. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah.